Hello, hello. This is Dr. Z. Zachary Brooks with Bilingual Decision Making. And this is a podcast. And this is a special podcast based on a week long series of presentations I did in Mexico at a Mexican university in October 2018. That university is called La Universidad Popular Autónoma del Estado de Puebla. Its acronym is called UPAEP. So think of um, acronyms for your local university. So for example, University of Arizona, we just say UA. Uh, other people say other things in other places. So UPAEP in Puebla. Um, and I presented to the students and the faculty at the um, Departamento Estudios de Lingua y Cultura. So Department of, of, um, Department of Language and Culture, basically. It was a very successful event. And I was asked uh, if I could share the event. And even though the recordings I made uh, during the presentation were, were solid, they don't really have the fidelity, which is the sound quality, to reprodu reproduce later. So with that, what follows is a recording of 10 hours of presentations I did during um, October 2018 at UPAEP. And the overview is, is this. So day one, I did the introduction and intercultural competence. Day two, I talked about brain and language. Day three, I talked about bilingual decision making. Day four, I talked about cultural decision making. And day five, I talked about adaptive leadership. So I hope you were able to learn a few things from these presentations. In the meantime, happy deciding. All right, so let's get going. So the presentation I did is called Culture, Cognition, and Change. I'm Dr. Z, Zachary Brooks. And here I am, the three C's and Dr. Z. So the contents, as they were, um, and I just said them a second ago, but in case you're just tuning in, um, on October 15th, I did an intro of Culture, Cognition, Change. The 15th and 16th, I did, um, I talked about intercultural competence. On the 16th and 17th, I talked about brain and language. On the 17th and 18th of October, I talked about bilingual decision making, which obviously is kind of up my alley. October 18th and 19th, I talked about cross-cultural decision making. And on October 19th, the final day, I talked about adaptive leadership. So the three C's, culture, cognition, and change. So during the presentation, during any presentation, I like to talk um, a little bit about myself, mostly just so people can get a sense of the person who's in front of them. Because when you go to a new place, a new campus, you can show up and act very smart in front of people. But you know, people actually like to connect to a human. And so I like to uh, throw tidbits of, about myself during the presentation, and you're going to get that as well during this audio version. So I was born in Denver, Colorado, and I've lived in six U.S. states. So the first question I ask students in the, um, in the presentation is, what is your definition of culture? What is your definition of culture? Well, the, the definitions I shared during the, the presentation were uh, just two of them. In the meantime, before I get to those, we can look on the, the slide here and we can see that one metaphor for culture is being uh, inside of a fishbowl. Only the idea there is that you're a fish and a fish um, can see the outside world, but the fish can only see the outside world through the glass in which he or she swims. And also the fish is in the water and the water itself is culture, and that's the practices and customs. Think about traditions your family has, think about your family communication style, and then go to your, your town, your school, your state, and the country. Think about the accents you use, think about the various um, ways you and your friends think about things, and maybe some of the disagreements you have, and all of those things are culture. So the definitions I used for this uh, presentation were uh, the Big C and Little C, Bennett, 1995, and Products, Practices, and Perspectives, uh, Galloway, 1992. 
And I know there's people maybe listening who certainly know more about culture than I do, but I think for the average person, these are good ways to think about culture in a way that helps grasp uh, the concept because any time you talk about culture, and these are people, I'm talking about sort of academics who talk about these things frequently, um, it's easy to, to go down you know, very deeply, but just for you know, regular folks who don't know these things super well, it's good to sort of capture um, some, some basic ideas and then we can all sort of participate together because the thing about a culture conversation is everyone has an opinion um, and can have an opinion because it's so much a part of who we are and how we behave. So the big C versus little c. So the big C is considered the objective culture and the little c is considered subjective culture. So objective culture might be something like an institution. Think about um, a library. Think about a uh, government office. Think about uh, a finance office run by the government. You can also think about um, history, literature, and fine arts. I mean, things that are elevated to be iconic and emblematic for a given culture. So that would be something called big C, a big C culture. But the little c is just as important, and th this is why I like the framing. We have two types of culture, the big C and the little c, and the little c is subjective. It's perspectives, daily living, your values, your beliefs, your use of language. And you can think about people who are 15 versus 35 versus 75 and how they might use language differently. And so you can look at culture from an age perspective. You can look at culture from a regional perspective. But the way you use language and all the things that go along with the use of language, how you believe things and how you value things, are things what we would call little c. The other way to think about culture is three p's. P, P, P. Products, practices, and perspectives. So the products are things um, that are valued to indicate prestige. So there's concrete and abstract. So for example, um, a house is a concrete product and it indicates prestige. Um, a abstract product would be, let's say, education. Yes, you can get a certificate of completion and you can put it on the wall, um, but that's abstract, but still it's a, it's a product. And then this is how society um, engages and how culture sort of works through these three P's. The second one is called practices. So practices can be things such as speaking and pragmatic. So the speaking and the way we talk about things gives value to the products. So in Spanish, um, there's a distinction between usted y tú. So usted is the formal you, so you use it with people you don't know, senior authorities, senior people, Maybe within a family you can sometimes use you. Generally within families people use two, but there is a distinction in a formal you versus an informal you. And the way people use language would give value to the product. So if your family or your group of people doesn't really care about expensive cars, then if you buy an expensive car, they might think, oh, that's, it's nice, but maybe they wouldn't value that in the same way they would value education. On the other hand, Maybe your family really likes cars because that's their hobby. And education's nice, but they'd rather have you go to work and get some real skills from, from doing things. And so that family or that group of people would value things differently. So these products and practices really um, interact with each other quite a bit. The third thing is perspective, sense-making system. So why is it that you value um, cars? Maybe it's not just the car, but it's uh, your family takes trips every summer and that those trips that your family takes every summer are extremely valuable and it relates to your value of the family and how the family needs to spend time together and if you're able to take these trips together then a car has a lot more meaning than just a nice car um, and you can think about your, in your own life like what perspectives um, you might have about other things so the th Second way to kind of think about culture, at least in my presentation, is products, practices, and perspectives, the three P's. So the next thing I did with the students, and this is like I said, the introduction, so this is going to move fairly quickly and then the subsequent uh, slides will focus on each of these areas in more detail, is what is your definition of cognition? So I asked 
students and you can ask yourself, what's your own definition of cognition? What comes to mind? For a lot of people, you know, brain processing, psychology, thought processes, those kind of things usually come to mind for people. So let's see the definition you know, formally, or at least a formal definition of cognition. So the mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and the senses. The mental action or process of acquiring knowledge and understanding through thought, experience, and the senses. So that's a definition of cognition. Now, a lot of times um, people, when you hear cognition, they think immediately psychology. So let's ask ourselves and let's figure out what are the, the distinctions between those two terms. And this is going to be more of an academic distinction. So what is the difference between cognitive science and psychology? Well, we have cognitive science, we have psychology. Cognitive science, um, you know, desires, you know, the people who um, call themselves cognitive science, they desire to understand the human mind better. Okay, that's a, a pretty good little concept. Now let's look at psychology. What do people who engage in psychology desire to do? Also, understand the human mind better. So at this point, cognitive science and psychology are very, very related. They bo both want to understand human, the human mind better. Um, cognitive science also very much wants to understand human intelligence and behavior. Psychology is interested in human functions and human behavior. So now we can see some, some similarities still. Human behavior is very important, and so is um, you know, the mental aspect of, of humans. But when we talk about human intelligence versus mental functions, we can start to see a small difference. Human intelligence, kind of more of an abstract concept. Mental functions, we can talk about a very specific thing, such as memory, how do you re remember things, decision making, how do you make decisions, those kind of things. And so now we're getting a, a small difference, a diversion between cognitive science and psychology. A diversion? I think that's correct, yeah a slight um, change. Uh, the next thing in cognitive science is people who use cognitive science to study the world are interested in the information processed and how that information is transformed into, another, um, into other information or action. Psychology, how the mind affects behavior. So now we can start to see real distinction. So when we talk about information processed and transformed to other action, we're very much staying within um, an intellectual, or a better word is academic, look at the human mind. When we talk about how the mind affects behavior, now we're really concerned not just with the mind, but really actions humans take. So people who have uh, drug addictions, you can look at their behavior and then work backwards and say, okay, what is going on in the mind that affects that behavior or influences that behavior? And now we're kind of going from an academic to more of an applied thing. And that's exactly the fourth bullet point here is that cognitive science tends, tends to be more academic and research-based and psychology tends to be more applied. So the next thing I asked the participants, the faculty members, and students, was their definition of change. So what's your definition of change? Well, here's a basic one. We have um, you know, <laughs> this evolutionary uh, pictures. There's a lot of these. They're pretty cute. Um, so, you know, we go from an ape monkey to a human now walking off a cliff. Well, that's one way, I guess, um, you can view human change. We went from one point to the other, and hopefully not, we're, we're not walking off a cliff. Maybe we are, but hopefully we're not. Uh, the next one, you can say, well, we've evolved to the point where now we're on social media. You know, at one point we're apes, we're walking tall and strong, and now we just post things on social media as if we were walking tall and strong. Well, that's something. Uh, the other one here, I'm not certain if you can see it. I don't think so. Um, the way I, I situated the slides, we went from ape, now we're to robotic, robotic, robotic man. You can't see this one, you'll have to trust me. And the fourth one, oh, there it is, the robotic man, excuse me. And the final one, 
uh, we can talk about change in terms of going from an ape or a monkey to a man who um, maybe could lose a few pounds because he's probably eating too much candy and so forth, which, you know, we all do. When I just add two candy, um, two little payday candy bars right before the podcast. So, you know, that's how, that's how life works too. Anyway, change. To make or become different. A very basic definition. Now, let's think uh, in terms of change and, and now direct it towards this particular presentation, which would be cultural change. So cultural change, we can talk about families, divorce, work, out is language change. So the graph on the slide, if you're just listening, I'll just talk out loud. If you are seeing the presentation, you can, you can see for yourself. So the graph on this slide is called the great vowel shift. And this is how vowels have changed over time. It's how we produce vowels differently. So at one point, um, I'll just use a couple examples. We had uh, the word um, boat, and that, that's a one vowel, bo. And then the vowel over time became boot. So bo, bu, and eventually about. And those, those vowels changed over time. So that would be an example of a language change. So language change can be the sounds, like I just uh, gave examples of, and how the vowels can shift over time. That's the point at which most of us produce a particular sound. So we used to produce vowels from one point, and those vowels connected to um, a couple different letters, and now over time those sounds have changed. Um, we can also talk about language change in terms of new words. So around the world there's a lot of uh, languages that are incorporating English, especially technology language, into their, their language. And sometimes they just take the word just as it is. Sometimes they incorporate it and make it a verb or a noun or an adjective in their own language and then they put their own language um, endings on that. Um, American culture does that as well, especially if you're close to the border of Mexico. You know, we use a lot of words um, from Mexico, the easy one from Spanish. Um, the easy ones are of course taco and burrito. These are food items that are not native to the United States. Instead of creating a new word, we just adopt the word whole and then we becomes be part of uh, the American English vocabulary, in fact, probably all of English at this point. And then the other type of language change is called semantics. So words can take on more meanings or less meanings over time. Uh, think of the word dope. You know, dope um, is slang for drugs, but dope can also mean something pretty cool. So that word um, over time can shift. It can have more meanings or fewer meanings or depending on the people you hang out with, dope can have one meaning, bad drugs, or it can have two meanings, bad drugs and, hey, that's really cool. So that's an example of language change as well. So at this point, I'm going to um, pause and um, stop the, the video because now we're gonna talk about the next um, the first day, actually, the first thing I talked about during my presentations in Mexico in October. So that's the end of the, um, of the introduction I did in Mexico in October 2018. This is Dr. Z, Zachary Brooks, Bilingual Decision Making Podcast, coming to you from your favorite local library with my good friend Goodyear. Uh, please subscribe and follow me at dr-z.net. DR Guion Zeta Punto Net Doctor Zeta Doctor Z Punto Net. Anyway, come back soon and we'll talk about intercultural competence. Family dinners, so think of your own life. Um, if you know people who are divorced, now there's a really good chance you, you do. And the rate of divorce, um, I'm not sure about the rate, but divorces um, are more acceptable and they're more frequent than they used to be. It used to be, let's say, 50 years ago, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. And how does that affect culture? Uh, do you have family dinners together um, always, maybe just once a week, maybe never, maybe you have the dinners in front of TV, not around a table. Those are examples of culture change. Work is huge. At one point, uh, there were fewer women, women in the workplace. Of course, now there are, of course, many women in the workplace. Uh, so that's a change over, you know, 40, or so years, how people work is very different. Many people don't work at companies for a long time, and now people work much more independently, um, which is 
you know, you can say good and bad, but it's certainly a change, and that would be an example of a cultural change. Schools, um, when schools reorganize themselves and reorganize the education they provide to kindergarten students and then high school students and colleges and so forth, that's an example of cultural change. And another one is federal governments. So, uh, for example, in Mexico in 2018, December 1st, just a few weeks from now, they will have a new president. So when you have a new president in an economy and a democracy like Mexico, that represents that the people want some uh, policy changes. Now, how that's going to be um, played out in Mexico or any country that has an election, that's a different question, but it certainly reflects a cultural change. Another kind of change we can talk about